Perfect. So um, I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Andreas Kronbichler. He's a senior clinical research associate um, at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom, working in the group of um, Professor David Jane. And he is going to address um, a second cluster of diseases in which we're going to focus our attention. So diseases such as SLE, um, antiphospholipid syndrome, and ANC-associated vasculitis. Welcome, Andreas. Well, thank you, Marina, uh, for this kind introduction. And, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I wouldn't consider myself as a big compliment expert, but I'm clearly interested in the treatments and, of course, the clinical trials we are facing now, improving the outcomes of our patients. So the last part of, of the talk is, is clearly the huge excitement because, as you know, we have a vacuban in our hands in anchor vasculitis. But preparing this presentation, I found out that we are really far away in lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome to have complement therapeutics actually hitting the market. So these are my disclosures, and I kept to the agenda given uh, by Marina and Richard and discussed basically every disease and the points one to three. And I also need to disclose that I like Florence, and this is a picture I've taken last year when I came here privately in July. Um, and with a few um, on the church, it's like uh, incredible. So uh, in lupus, we know that complement plays a crucial role. And if we go into animal models, we see that if you knock out C5A receptor, you can see that the key inflammatory infiltrates in kidney biopsies are actually significantly reduced. And also pathways involved in disease pathogenesis like in this case, uh, interleukin 17A is also reduced significantly. In many autoimmune disorders, such as anchor vasculitis and also lupus, neutrophil extracellular traps are central and crucial in the pathogenesis, attracting other inflammatory pathways. So this study looked at patients with a low degrading um, net capacity and compared it to a high degrading net capacity. And what they found is that if you have a low degrading capacity, patients are uh, more often having lupus nephritis. They have more often low complement and also a higher circulating double-stranded DNA antibodies. On the bottom of the slide, you can see that NETS or low degrading capacity of NETS is also driving interferon alpha, which is very central in the pathogenesis of lupus. And as mentioned, um, those patients with a low degrading capacity also have lower C4 and C3 levels. Looking at pathway analysis, and this is a transcriptomics uh, analysis looking at lupus nephritis biopsies, but also a murine uh, model of lupus nephritis, I just wanted to figure out that in both models, actually, you can see that complement is enriched, and also that pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic pathways are enriched, such as DGF-beta in this case. What's important is that uh, the C3A receptor and the C5A receptor in uh, immunohistochemistry slides is upregulated in glomeruli and in tubules. And if you look at the correlation between C3 deposits on the um, upper part here, um, you can see that it's correlating with TGF-beta um, in this case. So C3 is clearly uh, relevant in lupus and also C5A um, receptor. Looking at uh, preclinical models of therapeutics, we have been talking about already and we will talk in our breakout sessions. So there are some information down uh, or now published in the literature, and one of these examples is this trial with Ibdacoban, and Ibdacoban was given to this mice at week 19 for a treatment period of two weeks. And what the authors found is that key um, histologic parameters such as mesangial hyperplasia, which is prominent in class 1 and class 2 lupus nephritis, has been significantly reduced, as has been immune deposit uh, in kidney biopsies, um, crescents have been removed, and also tubulopathy. As a clinician, the most relevant finding here is clearly that um, proteinuria has been um, reduced to basically baseline as you can see, and on the right-hand side, you can see that serum creatinine uh, has remained stable over time, whereas those animals uh, without treatment had a significant increase in serum creatinine. 
Again, this comes with a reduction of C3 and C4 deposits. Another study has focused on Avacoban, and these authors have given the mice treatment after 12 weeks for two weeks. And what they found, and you can see it on the upper part here, clearly that the inflammatory infiltrate has been reduced significantly, and they have used FC gamma receptor 3B as a readout for neutrophil infiltration, and what they could uh, see is that this has been significantly reduced. Again, looking at the heart endpoint for us, proteinuria, avacuban reduced proteinuria in these animals. Clinical trials are up and running now, so there are a couple of phase two trials um, recruiting actively, and I think a Vacuban trial is also um, in the setup phase for lupus and lupus nephritis. What is known about complement inhibition, it's really um, not really a lot, not lot of on the market, so there are some reports about ecolizumab being effective in very refractory diseases, but mainly in patients actually having concomitant thrombotic microangiopathy. Looking at this subfield, uh, so ecolizumab efficacy in lupus with thrombotic microangiopathy, these authors performed a literature review and found that uh, almost all of their patients had a response after ecolizumab was started, and they defined response as a resolution of the symptoms that led to the treatment, discharge from hospital, or recovery of kidney function. Clearly, if one needs to summarize um, what we have learned and unsolved issues and future perspectives, there is a clear unclear evidence in a human model. If complement inhibition um, works in lupus, we know that ecolizumab might work in DMA patients. We have seen that factor B inhibition with abdacoban and uh, avacoban uh, were effective in animal models and clearly we need to wait on phase two trials and then following uh, phase three trials. The therapeutic landscape in lupus nephritis is changing ever since, so we have the approval of belimumab, we have the approval of voclosporin, and we have very promising phase two trial results with obinutuzumab, so it's hard to see what place actually complement inhibition in these individuals will have in future. Next, I will speak a bit about antiphospholipid syndrome, and this is a, a very nice um, picture from a review published five years ago in Kidney International. And you can see firsthand that this, this is a, a disease which is mainly mimicking DMA and a very severe vasculopathy um, with changes um, attributable to a very significant um, hypertensive problem. So there are different pathways involved in this. So one is the thrombotic pathway, and you know that patients need to go on anticoagulation. Another pathway is the vasculopathy pathway, and it's not that clear-cut which treatments are effective here. And the third pathway, and that's the most important for us here, is the DMA pathway. And we know that plasma exchange in some of these cases is effective, and likewise, I also think that ecolizumab in these patients is effective. So animal models have looked at um, thrombocytes and leukocyte um, uh, adhesion um, in, in, in these animals treated with uh, antiphospholipid serum. And you can see on the left side if the authors knocked out C3 that the thrombocytes has been decreased by around 67%. So in the wild type uh, treated with uh, antiphospholipid serum, there was an increase over threefold if on the bottom of the, the slide you can see if you treat um, patients with sera but they have a knockout, it's a similar um, size of thrombus actually than in wild type and in knockout mice treated with healthy sera. Importantly, these animals had circulating uh, cardiolipin antibodies. A similar effect was seen if they knocked out C5 with a thrombus reduction of 54%. Looking at complement inhibition, they have used the uh, anti-C5 antibody to prevent uh, antiphospholipid-induced uh, thrombosis. And you can see that when they applied this antibody, that the thrombocytes was similar to animals receiving healthy serum and healthy serum plus the antibody. So C5 blockade in these animals was proven very effective. 
going to animal study, uh, human studies, sorry about that. So this is a study, small study from Japan looking at anaphylotoxins um, measured C3A, C4A and C5A. You can see that C3A has been increased, especially in those patients who had a low C3, uh, so low three C3 and low C4 at baseline. But if patients had a normal C3, it was basically the same as control individuals. C5A was not um, upregulated in these individuals. So what is known in a therapeutic landscape? Not much, to be honest. So ecolizumab has majorly used uh, in the treatment of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome and to prevent catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome before renal transplantation. There was one attempt to perform a clinical trial, but this was terminated, and I couldn't find the reason, but I think we have people from Alexion here um, who might help uh, to answer this. So ecolizumab um, is recommended in very refractory caps um, together with B-cell depletion rituximab, and you can see the level of evidence and grade of recommendations is very low here, but the level of agreement um, quite high. On the right side, you see a, a more recent um, case series showing that roughly 50% of the individuals here responded to ecolizumab, but you can see if there were no non-responders, the mortality rate within the first couple of months was rather high with four fatalities out of six. So in antiphospholipid syndrome, clearly we need to create evidence that complement inhibition is effective um, to prevent or to treat antiphospholipid nephropathy. Uh, the alternative complement pathway might be an attractive uh, target as shown, and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is a very life-threatening uh, manifestation, and we might treat these patients earlier on with complement inhibition. So moving on to the last part, and I said probably the most exciting part is um, complementing encovasculitis. So we know since the early 2000s that complement is regulated, and then in animal models this has been picked up uh, in 2007 the first time. So this is a study from Hong Xiao from Chapel Hill, uh, Ron Falk and Charles Jeanette's group, showing that if you knock out the C5 uh, here, you have basically a complete inhibition of the crescent and necrosis um, in, induced um, by uh, anti-MPO IgG. They further looked at other complement factors and saw that if you knock out complement factor B, you can see pretty much the similar um, results. But if you look at C4, there was no change. So these animals had a similar amount of crescents and necrosis in comparison to wild type animals. So they furthered this uh, analysis and used CCX168, which is now known as Avacoban, and clearly showed if you treat these patients with uh, anti-MPO, IgG, you can induce crescents in those treated with anti-MPO and vehicle. So these, patients, uh, these animals had 30% crescents, and if you give these animals CCX168 at a very high dose, you could almost abrogate uh, crescent formation and these uh, animals had a, a crescent occurrence of around 3% only. Further evidence that complement is involved in anchor vasculitis and in the pathogenesis came from China from Professor Minghui Xiao's group largely, showing that the plasma level of C5A is even exceeding a dose with active lupus nephritis, and once these patients achieved remission, it went down and was comparable to those um, samples used from normal controls. The same was true for urinary levels of C5A, where they found that inactive anchor vasculitis was basically the same uh, level as inactive lupus nephritis, and again, once patients achieved remission, this went down and was comparable to uh, uh, healthy controls. But more so, also in the kidney biopsy, they found complement uh, deposition, as shown here, PP and C3D, and the terminal complement complex, which was found in glomeruli, but also in the vessel wall. This led to initiation of two phase two trials, classic and clear, and clearly we are here to talk about the ADVOCATE trial. As Professor Rimuzzi already mentioned, 330 patients were randomized, 166 received Avacoban and 164 prednisone. 
Um, rituximab was used as an ad uh, additional immunosuppressant in 214, and the remainder received cyclophosphamide, either intravenous or peroral. So prednisone dose was significantly reduced, as you would expect, so in the VECOBAN group, 1.35, and one needs to say that the patients at the time of randomization could be on 20 milligram of prednisone, which had to be tapered off within the first four weeks. Plus, patients, of course, receiving rituximab had before receiving rituximab a steroid uh, treatment to prevent allergic reaction. Two primary efficacy endpoints were studied. The first one was remission at week 26 and no use of steroids uh, four weeks before that. And then the more important one is sustained remission. At week 26 and uh, week 25, uh, 52 remission and no receipt of glucocorticoids within four weeks um, before that. And you can see on the left side the results for Recoban. So at six months, 72% with remission and at 12 months, 66% uh, with sustained remission in comparison to 70% uh, in the steroid group at six months and 55% uh, at 12 months. Clearly showing that Avecoban was non-inferior in the short term, but superior in the long term. Looking at relapse, and this is important also for us uh, as nephrologists because every renal relapse increases the risk of end-stage kidney disease. You can see that uh, those receiving Avecoban had significantly lower frequency of relapses. And one point of criticism of this trial is that if you received reduximab plus steroids, you were basically immunosuppression free by week 20 to 22. And, but you can see here that basically relapses occurred quite early onset uh, already in the prednisone group. So clearly Evacuban is doing something to our patients. More exciting for me is the data on EGFR recovery. So this is data on 265 patients, showing that in the short term, uh, red is the evacuban treated patients, they had a significantly better EHGFR recovery, and this was sustained until week 52. Looking at those with a, a grade four CKD, this became even more exciting. And at the end of the follow-up, so 52 weeks, uh, patients in the Vacuban group had an increase of around 14 milliliters in comparison to 8 milliliters in those receiving prednisone. Among subgroups, there was basically the signal was seen in all subgroups. So um, predominantly relapsing patients had a very good response to a Vacuban and the MPO positive patients and uh, MPA patients and those either receiving cyclophosphamide or rituximab. But there are also remaining a lot of unsolved issues, and this is my, my last slide. So we don't know anything about Avacuban efficacy in those at high risk to have end-stage kidneys. That means those patients with a GFR below 15, and we don't know anything about beyond uh, 52 weeks, so we don't have any information about maintenance therapy. We have no proper information on histology, and this is clearly an issue because we are usually basing our treatment decisions, one uh, on GFR or creatinine, and B on histology. So those with a very acute inflammation on kidney biopsy, we should have information if Avacuban is as effective as steroids. I would assume so. We have no information about extra renal disease for us working in the vasculitis field. That's important if it's working in the ENT space or not. One thing is, of course, patients need to take six tablets a day, and that's kind of inconvenient. And uh, uh, InfraRx is developing an injection um, which, has been, which should be used every two weeks and is also blocking the C5A receptor and it, uh, in a, yeah, it, the, the phase two trials have been completed. The costs are an issue because steroids are clearly very cheap and an effective comparator. And as I said, it's not only the histology, but it's also the progression from acute lesions to chronic lesions, which we see if we do repeat biopsies in anca vasculitis. And it would be good to show that Avacuban is very effective to prevent this and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I take uh, questions if needed.